In the name of the Father, the Son, the Amen. And, uh, one of my favorite saints, and the, the patron saint of people who cannot do anything right and can never get their life together. Um, just, if this is you, um, this is your saint, and, and you'll hear why. Um, and you, you'll see just throughout, just like something obviously was wrong with this guy, right? But that doesn't matter. I, anybody can become a saint. St. John of God, uh, proof anybody can become a saint. Um, he was born in 1495 to devout parents and heard a visiting priest talk about the adventures that awaited a young man in the world in the 1500s. Um, I mean, who knows if it was actually a priest or not, but filled young St. John of God's head with, um, you know, the wonders that were out there, and he was no saint as, as a young man. I don't know. How old was he? Um, you know, probably around 12, 12 or 13. That's when, you know, uh, kids get, get these crazy ideas in their heads. Well, that very night, he ran away from home and joined this priest to go find adventure. Um, just ran off. Talk about giving your parents gray hairs. Eventually, he wound up alone and orphaned in Toledo, Spain. All right, serves him right. Good thing something worse didn't happen. He ended up begging in the streets until he was taken as, as a kind man. And he worked for this man as a shepherd attending his flocks until he was 22 years old. Apparently never thought about returning back to his parents and telling them what had happened. Um, but anyways, this man ends up taking a liking to John. He was with him for, I don't know, maybe, probably close to 10 years, 8 or 10 years probably. And uh, actually wanted uh, uh, John to marry his daughter and inherit his estate. Uh, but John was reluctant, didn't really want to do this. So one day, just as suddenly as he decided to run away from home, he decided to leave this man and go off and join the army. So he does. He just up and leaves and joins a troop of soldiers. Uh, he spends several years in the military service where he nearly died. Not from battle, but from execution for incompetence. He had been assigned to guard a great quantity of treasure of war spoils, and he was so incompetent that much of it was stolen. Uh, he would have been put to death, but apparently they recognized he's so like incompetent that we, we can't do it. So they, he was simply dismissed. So what does St. John of God do? He returns to life as a shepherd. He knows how to do that. But after a few years, once again, uh, goes and joins the military. This time he would spend 18 years as a soldier. And he was not living a very good life. He would become St. John of God, but right now he was just like John the soldier and, and, and not a very good one. Um, in, in any sense of the word. Uh, however, he was, he did finally have a conversion experience when facing imminent death in battle. He vowed that if he survived, he would change his life. Uh, well, he did survive, and he did change his life. As soon as he was able, he went to confession, uh, he left the military service, and then he decided to try to find his original parents. So kind of, I guess, some compunction of heart finally uh, entering in. Uh, but to his dismay, when he, when he returned, he learned both of his parents were dead. So once again, he takes up tending sheep. So now St. John is in his mid-40s by now, right? He's not married. He doesn't have any skills in life. He has no money. He has no direction. He has no self-control. He's prone to these fits of just doing stuff in the middle of the night. Uh, he's always wondering what, what, what he's going to do with his life. He decides he wants to see Africa and I'm going to rescue slaves captured by Muslims. So he sets off in the middle of the night, right, probably. Um, but he's waiting for his ship. He goes down to Gibraltar in, in, um, in, in Spain, um, and here he meets a noble family, a husband, a wife, and a daughter, and they are being exiled due to political intrigues. And he felt so sorry for this family that he abandons his original plan and decides he's going to go along with them wherever they go. So once again, plans are changing. Well, this actually apparently uh, was part of the providence of God, for as soon as his family and, and John, of the, John of God reaches the, their place of exile, the whole family falls very sick except for John. And he kept them alive by caring for them, not only caring for them, but by working and earning enough money to feed them. So eventually the family recovered, uh, the father was granted pardon, and they were able to return back to Spain, right, thanks to St. John. So he's finally, I guess, uh, kind of coming around and able to do some good. Uh, so John of, the, John of God goes back with them, back to Spain, and then he wonders what he's going to do. He's here on the docks, right where we started before he left for Africa. Um, he gets a job as a dock worker. 
He is unloading cargo ships and continuing, though, to his resolution of living a good life. Um, no doubt he was assisted by the graces he earned uh, for caring for that sick family. He spent his free time reading spiritual books and visiting churches to pray rather than engaging in the usual activities common to sa sailors and dock workers. Um, he's probably a little bit, probably, I don't know, uh, older uh, than, than, than a lot of them because many of them are other, probably young men in their teens and 20s, you know, unloading ships. And that's hard work, you know, for him being in his mid-40s, you know, almost 50 years old, you know, a little hard on the old back there. But um, anyways, he's, he's working. Uh, but he enjoys, actually, he finds that he enjoys reading books so much that he quit working on the docks and became a traveling book salesman, going from town to town selling books, holy cards, and other items. Um, this is kind of a novelty, actually, in this time. It's the mid-1500s, and the printing press was only invented, you know, in the, in the 1450s. So by now it's catching on. It's kind of a novel thing. Um, and, you know, history happened slower in those days. It'd be like, you know, the Internet after it was 10 or 15 years old. Uh, so he's kind of engaging in this. He finally decides he's going to settle down and be responsible, you know, being halfway to 100. And he opens a bookstore in uh, Granada. Uh, after some time, St. John of Avila comes through and is preaching a sermon in the town on repentance. Uh, St. John of God is so distraught at the remembrance of the evil sins of his youth that he immediately went back to his bookstore, tore up any secular books that he had, gave away all of his religious books and holy cards, gave up all his money, tore his clothes, and collapsed weeping. Right? Pretty, pretty, pretty standard for what his life has been like until now. Uh, the townspeople thought that he'd gone mad, so they put him in a mental hospital. Yeah, it was probably about time. After 40 days, John of Avila uh, uh, comes along, and he's, he's heard, of course, the effect his sermon had uh, on this guy. So John of Avila comes to the mental hospital. He tells John of God, look, you've done enough penance. It's been 40 days. Even as our Lord spent 40 days in the wilderness, that, that's enough penance. You, you, can, you, can, um, you, know, you can come out now. You can stop. So John of God recovers from his despondency, and he begins to help out at the mental hospital. And he actually did very well. He did so well in helping in the hospital that he became a valued member of the staff. Um, St. John of Avila became uh, John of God's spiritual director and encouraged him to found a hospital of his own uh, for the poor. John of God did so in his typical fashion by announcing it suddenly and starting work immediately on everything all at once. Uh, he immediately went out to the poorest parts of the city, uh, bringing food and comfort to those living in abandoned buildings and under bridges and so on. Uh, he would do odd jobs and collect driftwood from streams and sell it in the public square to try to raise funds, in addition to begging for alms and, and so on and trying to find anything he could. Um, eventually, he did obtain a small house and um, a later an abandoned Carmelite monastery, and these became not only a hospital, but also a kind of a homeless shelter. Um, you know, some, some people gave him alms, some supported the mission, others accused him of harboring troublemakers, and, and some people saw him as a troublemaker himself. Um, you know, this is, this is what happens when, I don't know how to say it, when crazy people start to become holy, they, they don't stop being crazy, right? That's, that's not a guaranteed virtue of God, like sanity or a normal way of living. That doesn't go along with, with God's plan sometimes. Um, so once he encountered a group of starving people, and he was so distraught at their plight that he ran into a nearby house, took the pot of food that was cooking on the stove, and brought it out and fed it to the people in the street. Another time, he encountered a group of children dressed in rags, and he was so sorrowful, he went into a clothing store and, and, and bought them all new clothes, and then announced that he didn't have any money. So that's the kind of stuff that he would do, right? Uh, but, I mean, come on, look, out, look, look at how poor they are. Aren't you filled with remorse? Don't you just want to give them the clothes, like me? Yeah. So, so he's, the, you know, I mean, some people love him, some people hate him, and, and he, he's just filled with the charity of God, um, even though he's not filled with very much common sense. Um, but his impulsivity also saved lives. And once uh, the town hospital caught on fire and he rushed to the site, only to find everybody there standing around. And I don't know what, what these people were thinking or, or how bad the fire was, but uh, St. John of God rushes into the blazing uh, building and carries uh, the patients out, um, even, even while everybody else is standing around. He goes in and he carries out all these patients. He's carrying them out like one by one or leading other people by the hand, and he's got enough time to do it. 
Not only that, he has enough time to save all the people. He goes back in and starts saving the, the, the beds, the blankets, the sheets, and the mattresses. He's throwing them out of the window into the street because he knows by experience how, much, how hard it is to come by, and he's got a hospital that he needs this stuff for. He's not just going to let it burn. Not only does he not have enough time to save all the people and all the blankets and mattresses, he has enough time to go onto the roof and start cutting away a section of the building that connects it to another building to try to prevent the fire from spreading. Well, while he's up there um, cutting away this building, uh, he actually falls through into the burning building itself. You know, the sparks go floating out. And, and people thought, this is the end. He's just fallen into this blazing inferno. There's, there's no way. Well, he just comes walking back out the ground floor, you know, like covered in soot and smoke and who knows what parts of him are burned. Uh, but but it's just absolutely heroic um, endeavor. And it, it seems to be this, this is... Um, I don't know, when, when people probably started to take him uh, much more seriously. So he was attracting uh, followers, people to help him in his endeavors. Um, and, and this is how God works. Um, you know, and, and this is how actually many, many um, uh, uh, um, uh, religious orders work, is that the founders aren't necessarily the ones who actually found the order or get it off the ground. They have the initial fervor and zeal, like St. John of God, but they don't have, they're not organized, they can't do finances, they, they, they don't really have, you know, all those other skills necessary. But, but their example and their, and, and their zeal and their love and their charity uh, bring other people together, and then around that, a, a religious order can form. So that's what ended up happening with St. John of God. Um, uh, he, he himself uh, would, would get together some companions who were able to do all those things necessary to make a stable organization, and they would become known as the Brothers Hospitallers. Uh, they were, they were um, um, actually founded after his death in, in 1572, about 20-some about years after he died. Um, and St. John would die in the service of others. Um, there, there, was, um, so, uh, there, there was a great flood in the city, and it brought with it a great quantity of driftwood. And this is, this is how St. John of God would, would make money. He would collect driftwood in the streams. So he and another companion, some companions went down to the stream, and they're fishing out this driftwood from the water. And one of his companions falls in. And uh, John of God, actually, he, he, he'd been sick. He'd already been sick. He was on his sick bed, but he finds out there's this opportunity. So he gets out of his bed, even though he's sick and, and pretty weak. Uh, uh, and he's there by the stream. Well, he jumps in to help his fellow companion, and they both are rescued, uh, but that was it for, for St. John of God. He got pneumonia, from which he never recovered, and would die in 1550 at the age uh, of 55 years old. Uh, but as I mentioned, um, his, his um, work would continue. Um, those who had gathered around him uh, uh, created that, that religious order called the Brothers Hospitallers, and the order is still currently active today in 40 countries. They have 1,200 religious members and 40,000 associates who assist in caring for the sick and, and, the, and, and those working in hospitals. Um, so what a testament to a guy that couldn't get his act together, to somebody who didn't have a normal life and who had, in his mid-40s was a shepherd in the middle of a field with no prospects and nothing going on. Uh, and he ends up, you know, there's 40,000 people still working today because of something he did 500 years ago. But that's what grace can do. That's what God can do. That's what sanctity can do. And, and like I said, it doesn't mean having all the virtues. And th this is just in our eyes. The, the, um, we would never look at somebody like that and say, yeah, that, that person is going to be a saint and a founder. Like, are you kidding me? Give me a break. Um, but that's exactly what happened. You know, God does not judge how we judge. And, and I'm remembering a few, a few weeks ago, um, what was her name? That, that blessed, blessed Emerentianus, I think was her name, that schizophrenic nun from the, from the 1600s. No, no, no order would have admitted her or let her stay. She's like having psychotic breaks with reality. You know, they're tying her up for days at a time and doing exorcisms. And, and, but in between, she's docile and obedient. Right? Serious mental problems, but she wants to be good. Same thing with John of God. You know, some people, you know, we think you need to be more responsible. What's wrong with you? Um, they may not even know themselves. There are just certain people, and they don't get it. Like, they, they look around, and they see responsible people, and they see this, and they don't even know how that works. That's just how the mind, the, just, just how our minds fall out. Um, God does not promise competency. Right? He, he promises sanctity and mercy and, and happiness and joy, right? That the fruits of the Holy Ghost, which of the fruits of the Holy Ghost is like being successful, 
right, or, or being, uh, um, um, you know, a punctual or responsible, right? It, it's, that's not a fruit because that may not be there. Some people just have that problem and they can't get their act together, and that is okay. Um, so, I, I mean, two things. Number one, do not judge people too harshly who are kind of in this same category. You know, don't, don't blame people for what they can't do. Blame people for what they will not do. That's how God judges. God will not judge you for what you cannot do, right? He won't, he's not going to judge you for not being successful. God is going to judge you for not being willing, for not being generous, right? All of us can give. All of us can be generous. All of us can try. That's what God expects from us. He doesn't expect us to be successful or, or to have all these virtues that we might not be able to have. And we need to be able to, to, to be that patient with other people. Recognize when somebody's trying and when they're really giving their best as opposed to when they are not. And don't be upset when, when, when people just can't do it. So, um, as I would say, and you know, e even better, right, if that person is you, if, if you're the person who can't get your life together or just seems like everything's out of control, do not worry, right? Look at what you can control. And what can you control? Right here, what's on the inside? I can control my anger. I can control, like, my response. Um, I can control, like, my, my decision, right? People don't realize happiness is a choice. A lot of it is a choice. Choose to be happy. Choose to be grateful. Uh, uh, those kinds of things are what's in our control. Not what happens on the outside, right? And even on the inside, even some people struggle with, like, fits of anger. They have this, this, these, these feelings that they don't really feel like they can't make the feelings go away, uh, but they can choose, do I give in to them or not? Do I resist them? Or, or what do I do? Uh, so that's what we can do, right? That, that is within our power is, is to make those decisions based on what we have. A lot of virtue, a little bit of virtue, uh, raging passions, uh, a call. Maybe, maybe we have to, 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 to work up that zeal within ourselves. Whatever it is, right? Take what God has given us. Do the best we can. Be generous. That's what God expects. And then despite, despite the fact that you think your life is a failure, well, anybody looking at St. John of God would have thought the same thing. And yet here we are, you know, 500 years later, and look at what, he was, he, what his, his example still has caused in the world. Right? That is what God can do with every single one of us. We just have to be willing to follow his will. What does he want from you? Do that. Make that your one goal in life. I want to do what God's plan for me is, and everything's going to turn out better than you can possibly have expected. Right? Better than we could have ever planned. Uh, let that be our, 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 our goal uh, today. St. John of God, pray for us, and may God bless you all in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Amen.